And now I'm going to hand over to Dominic Schneider, um, who's going to do all good things come to an end, challenges in migrating 16 years of research software history so from subversion to Git. Thank you very much. I'm glad you're all here today. And I'm Dominic Schneider. I'm working at German Aerospace Center in Cologne, Germany. And I'm a software developer. So yeah, let's start. At first, I'm going to talk about the software we are developing at uh, DLR and at uh, whose repository we're looking at. Afterwards, I'm going to dive into the technical details about the migration from subversion to Git. Afterwards, we are going to talk about some branching models we're using to integrate Git in our daily workflow. And at the end, I'm going to talk about how we migrated our Jenkins CI to GitLab CI and a little bit about how we migrated our Mantis bug tracker to GitLab issues. RCE is short for Remote Component Environment, and we have started the development already in 2006. It is a Java-based application using OSGI as module system, and we are depending on the Eclipse Rich Blind platform, meaning it, yeah, it delivers us uh, some libraries for a graphical user interface and a plugin system. And we are really, really proud about that RCE is an open source software. RCE is used to create and execute distributed workflows for analyzing and simulations. So if you're more interested in about what RCE does, you can take a closer look at our Software X paper we published last year. Or if you're more interested uh, from a user's perspective, take a closer look at our IEEE Aerospace Conference paper we have published this year. Let's take a closer look at the technical migration, the repository we want to migrate. Our repository consists of about 32,000 commits, and at the moment we have 40 actively uh, used branches. Over the whole time of RCE, we have over 38 different authors, and in some we have collected on about 6,000 files containing 430,000 lines of code. This is all structured into 200 different modules. And because the history from RCE is that long, we had to do some changes to the subversion layout. Um, so we use a different directory for our closed branches, so we can easily, easily check out what we have finished. And we are uh, doing something different about this text structure because during the years we had many, many releases and uh, got a little bit uh, not not easy to handle. So therefore, we uh, introduce a hierarchical structure, grouping the release versions by the major versions. Another specialty we are using are subversion externals. For everybody who doesn't know what subversion externals are, it's a little bit like Git large file support. It can handle binary files. So what are we storing in subversion externals? We are storing some dependencies, and this is quite unusual, but we had to do it because some of our dependencies weren't available at all time. And to make our build system more stable and robust, we had to integrate those uh, dependencies into our repository. So when I talk about migration, what am I talking about? I'm talking about migrating the full history from subversion to Git, because the history is an integral part of how to work with the repository and how to understand um, code you have not never worked with before. So this is uh, an important requirement. Besides other requirements, uh, we need to handle a, a tool which, can, uh, which does the migration for us, needs to handle a custom repository layout, as I um, described earlier. And it uh, should handle the subversion externals migration for us. But I can spoiler you at this point, there is no tool which can handle it. So um, what would be really nice for this tool, uh, it should be open source and at best free of usage. So what are the tool candidates we're looking at? The most uh, recommended tool you will find on the internet is Git Subversion. It is a part of the normal Git uh, installation um, and it allows you to mirror a Subversion repository directly into a Git repository. It works very fine for little projects, um, but the problem with this is that our history is so long um, it can't really handle it because it's very unstable. During the process of migrating RCE, it has to be restarted several times and it is insanely slow. I tried to migrate it and it took about eight hours and after that I gave up with this tool, so I was searching for something else. 
Often recommended, by, for example, by GitLab uh, themselves, is SubGit by Teammate. It's a commercial tool um, and probably a good option for smaller projects too. But there was one thing I really did not like about it. It was that it is dependent on the remote subversion repository, meaning when it does the migration, it depends on the network speed. So um, the tool we are actually using is called Subversion Alphas Export. It is developed by KDE to uh, migrate their own repositories. And their own repositories are even larger than the repository I'm going to, I was it to migrate. And what I really, really like about this tool is that the configuration is quite powerful because it is all based on paths and regular expressions. And it uses a local repository dump, meaning you can create a dump of your subversion repository, put it on a very powerful machine, and then you can do the migration. And that's why it's so fast. I could do the migration of all the 32,000 commits in about 15 to 20 minutes. That's insane. I was really surprised about this tool. And it has also a good documentation. It's open source. And it also migrates all your author information from subversion to Git. If you want to try it out, you can use it on Windows using Docker. You can use it uh, via in Linux. Or you can use it on your Mac uh, by use, uh, installing it via Mac ports. So how does the migration actually work? At first, you need some files. You need a subversion dump. It's uh, just like it's a backup from your subversion repository. You need an author's file mapping all your subversion author infos to the git infos. And you need a rules file. And the rules file is the heart of the migration. And it consists of about uh, three parts. The first part is the repository definition, because you can create multiple target Git repositories where you want to migrate to, meaning you can split up your subversion repository into multiple Git repositories during the migration. And the main part of the rules file are the rules themselves, and they are all path-based, means you uh, create a rule for a special path, and then you define what happens with all those files matching this path. And the first rule is quite easy. It just uh, migrates all our files within the trunk into our, uh, into our repository and uh, giving it the, uh, into the branch master. Quite easy. So what's a little bit more advanced is how we uh, migrate our hierarchical tag directory because we are just interested in the release name and the release version. And therefore, we are using these uh, groups within our regular expressions to get the name and actually create the branches prefixed with tag, minus, minus. And then we are referencing the second group matched in the path, which is the release version. And at the end, you have just a closing rule because it's all path-based, and every path in the end has to be matched. After you have created your uh, Git rep uh, your subversion repository to Git, you maybe want to do some cleanup. So you uh, have to prepare a cleanup script, maybe rename some branches, delete already merged branches, and probably do some history writing. We decided actually against history writing because we think the history in Git should be as close as possible um, to as it was when we were using subversion. There was one part I left out. I said it would be pretty neat if we could migrate our subversion externals, our dependencies, um, because our build system relies on it. So the sad story about it is the subversion externals, the history is lost. I didn't found a tool which can do it for me automatically. So I had to do it manually. So where do I want to migrate to? Um, the Git LFS is the closest thing to subversion externals within the Git world. And so I was uh, targeting Git LFS. Um, if, you don't, um, if you don't have already migrated some of your dependencies to Git, uh, to Git LFS, you probably just would to do it uh, manually, and probably you can just do it for your latest commit. You, you could do some history writing, inserting all those uh, LFS stubs, but this is quite uh, cumbersome. We, in our case, we were actually pretty lucky because uh, for about four to five years, we were creating an artificially history from uh, just from our uh, releases and pushing them to GitHub. And on this, uh, in this repository, already we created our our uh, binary files to LFS and we put those LFS stubs, which were created in this process, into our subversion repository. And as they are only text files, um, the tool I represented earlier can just migrate them to Git 
And as we have the LFS uh, files, actual files in GitHub, and the stubs now in our new Git repository, we can actually get those files back. But this is, we were just lucky that we have done this. This wasn't uh, on purpose. So maybe if you want to have to tackle this migration in future, maybe start early to migrate your uh, binaries you're using. So now we have migrated our subversion repository to Git. But now comes to an essential part when you want to work with Git, you have to follow some rules. And these rules are all defined by branching models. And the most common branching models are Git flow, GitHub flow, and GitLab flow. And I think the main difference between all those uh, branching models is how you want to handle your releases. So Git flow is more like a traditional way where you only doing releases when you have multiple features uh, finished and then you do a, a larger release. GitHub flow is more like you have finished one feature and then you want to do a little release. And GitLab flow has quite a different philosophy because it's all about different environments. You have some features which are quite unstable. They are a part of a staging environment. Afterwards, you do some testing. You're moving into pre-production. And then if you have, to do, you have done the final release testing, they are moved to production. So in our case, we are doing one, uh, one major release in about two or three years and several minor releases within one year. So we start with Git flow as our base, but we weren't quite, um, we didn't like the naming, so we changed something about that. Um, but what is pr probably more interesting is the additions we made because we want to maintain multiple major versions of our software in parallel. Um, this is why, uh, um, that's because our software is heavily dependent on project fundings and sometimes our project partners uh, want some new features which uh, don't fit our current uh, major release. Uh, it would introduce some breaking changes and therefore we then have to start developing for the next major release. So in Gitflow you have two uh, main branches, uh, the development branch and the uh, and, uh, master branch, we rename him to integration and stable branch. So we create one of these long living branches um, for each major version. And then when we start to develop on a new feature, we have to decide, is it going to our current release or is it going into the next release? We did some minor changes too. We want to treat hotfix releases like, normal re uh, like the other releases too. We don't want to change uh, something in the behavior there but we changed something about the, uh, about the release tags because in normal Git flow you're uh, tagging when you are um, merged your release branch into your master branch, but we want to tag already when we are releasing and tag the release branch because then all the tags are available within all other branches, the feature branches for example, or the development branch. You might think we uh, have now talked enough about the branching models, but um, there's one little thing the branching models don't take into account. Here's uh, on the left side, you can see a screenshot I made from, uh, from a test migration I did earlier. And uh, if you want to work with uh, this graphical representation, you can, you can just do it. It's impossible. It's, uh, so how do we prevent this in future? And we have to define uh, a a guideline how to uh, how to merge your finished branches and we will enforce that we rebase all our development branches and uh, that we do th then do a merge with no fast forward meaning uh, you a special commit is created uh, for your rebase branch so that you can easily undo your uh, your merged your merge feature and don't have a chain of commits so that it looks like you never had a feature branch at all. But for sure, we don't rebase our release branches because you have tagged them, you can't uh, rebase them. So let's talk a little bit about continuous integration. We were using a C, uh, cont uh, Jenkins CI and if we would uh, keep it as simple as possible, we could just adapt our Jenkins build jobs. We could exchange the checkout type from subversion to Git and prepare um, the jobs for a multi-project build. But um, we, during, during our work with Jenkins, we encountered some issues. For example, um, if we would like to test our, our product with a new Java version, um, 
and then we had to install it on the Jenkins environment, we had to adapt our build shops manually, and it was uh, quite cumbersome. So we decided before we migrate to GitLab CI, we want to encapsulate the most of our build process into containers so that uh, for each part of our build pipeline, there is a special container and most of the logic is not saved into a GitLab a YAML file or in a Jenkins job description. So we have our build, our quality assurance, unit testing, BDD testing, packaging, and um, signing of our packages. We have all the logic included in several containers. What's maybe a little bit more interesting is how we want to interact with our CI system because we don't uh, want to run our full CI pipeline on every commit because a build of our of our product uh, is about six minutes and this is without any, any tests. And uh, so we want to make it possible that a developer can, uh, can control the CI in a quite easy way. So and when you start developing a feature, the first commits will be unstable. You don't want to have a build of it or to run any tests. But at some point, your feature will be ready for a first build. And then we want to have something which is uh, quite easily to use and very lightweight. And one of the things which is very lightweight in Git are branches because they are just pointers to some commit. So um, if we want to trigger a build or a build including tests, we just create a new branch containing some build flags and then push it to our, to our um, repository. In this case, GitLab CI would trigger exactly um, the steps which, is, which are defined in the name of our new branch we created. And what's the beauty about it is that if we have finished our developing of the feature, we can easily remove those branches and the information on which commit we have run our CI and with which steps, it is, uh, it is gone for good. So the last step uh, is to how we uh, migrate our Mantis bug tracker to GitLab. It is all based on a little, a little tool, Kitware, a company from the US, provided and was forked by some colleagues of us here at uh, DLR. Uh, it's all based uh, on a CSV export. It's convert, uh, to convert all the issues to JSON. You can download all your attachments and issue relations and afterwards push it via GitLab API uh, to GitLab. It's quite straightforward, so I won't go into detail here. And here, this is my last slide. It's, my, it's your pre-flight checklist if you have to do a migration. And I just want to show you that there are lots of questions you have to answer when you want to migrate one version control system to another one. Um, so it's not just uh, taking the latest commit and uh, put all the files into the next version control system. So you have to solve lots of problems during your way. And uh, please keep this in mind if you tackle the same problem. Thank you for your attention. And I'm ready to answer your questions. OK, so first question, do you really need the whole history going back forever? You just said something about this. Or would key release snapshots be enough, especially going back a bit further? We have experimented using just part of the history, but the problem with this is that we have many open feature branches. I know this is maybe an anti-pattern, but it is as it is. Uh, and if you have lots of branches which date uh, back a lot of time, uh, you would have to find a point where none of these branches has existed to make a clean cut. And this is uh, diff more difficult than just migrating the full history. Okay, did you get any resistance from any of the development team uh, when the idea of migrating from Subversion to Git was first mooted? And if so, how did you manage that? Actually, it was quite the opposite case. Everybody was uh, very happy that we are going to migrate to Git because uh, if you ever have done uh, merging an old Subversion branch, uh, you know what I mean. Yeah, um, yeah, so I didn't have to persuade someone in our team. They were all just happy that we could do the migration. Would Git bisect work for bug finding across the artificial Git history? I, if, I, if I run tests with old versions, will it be happy? 
Uh, I have to admit I haven't tested something like that, but I assume it would work. But the artificial history um, you're referring to on our GitHub uh, mirror, um, you would only learn where uh, be, um, would learn on which release the bug was inside. So the information isn't that isn't really useful because you really want to know which commit introduces the error, and therefore you need the full history and not just the history. Um, uh, the history based on the releases. Are there any aspects of your development practices and workflows generally decided to change uh, when you moved to Git? What are the main benefits of those changes? Um, the main thing uh, we changed is uh, that we enforce how to merge all those, uh, the feature branches, the rebasing, and uh, to get a clean copy of uh, the repository, but uh, I have to say at this point, the migration is still a work in progress. So it's not completely finished yet, and I can uh, can give any deep ins uh, uh, yeah, insights about how uh, how it is working in the long term. This is probably our last question. Did your subversion repository have features not directly representable in Git? file properties, SVN, copy, etc. And if so, how did you handle or migrate them? SVN copy is quite a good example um, because uh, I was very uh, surprised that the tool I was using, a sub, uh, Subversion Allfast Export, could uh, handle these. Um, not per default, but there is um, some options you can include in those rules that it tries to detect movements within the repository. So. Um, it took me a little bit to find this out, but in the end, it was solvable. And I don't, also I have not uh, found any other features which couldn't uh, be represented in Git. Right, fantastic. So can we say thank you to uh, Dominic again? That was great.